This is the Everything 80s Podcast, Episode 10, The Bizarre Story of Teddy Ruxman. Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s Podcast, brought to you by EverythingEatsPodcast.com. I'm Jamie, and you know, talking toys and things like that are a dime a dozen now. We we take technology for granted, but which toy in the mid 80s was maybe the originator of all this? So Teddy Ruxman was an animatronic children's toy that could talk and move its eyes and mouth while telling stories. It was a combination of many unique influences from Disney to Chuck E. Cheese came out in 1985 and became the best-selling toy of the mid-80s, believe it or not, and also led to a very popular cartoon show. So this is going to look at the very interesting and kind of bizarre story of Teddy Ruxpin. And before we get into it, if you haven't, make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, wherever. I should be there. Okay, let's get into it. Okay, so I never had a Teddy Ruxman growing up, but I remember it being a very huge deal and a very uh, desired and coveted toy. And it was impossible to ignore from all the commercials. But I, I think I still thought of it like a teddy bear, and I was more concerned with you know G.I. Joe or Transformers at that point. But it's still a real symbol of the 80s. And surprisingly, like I said, was the best-selling thing uh, for 1985 and 1986 when you it's very impressive when you think that this is kind of the golden age of toys and so much came out at this time so you know Teddy Ruxman has gone through a bunch of changes it's been owned by multiple companies it's tried to advance as the technology has changed um, and it's still like I said connected to some kind of bizarre stories in history so let's look at the creation of of Teddy Ruxman. It, he was first created by a guy named Ken Forsey, who started out working for Disney, and then he shortly um, after worked for Sid and Marty Croft, who, if you're familiar with them from the 70s, gave, gave us a lot of uh, LSD-inspired entertainment. So Forsey was big in animatronics, and one of his first big projects was providing the animatronic characters on Welcome to Pooh Corner. I don't know if you remember that show, um, the... Winnie the Pooh cartoon that, but it started with the animatronic characters in the start, kind of a little bit creepy, but still sort of cool. But that's what would end up influencing the design of Teddy Ruxpin. And his big goal was to get into the commercial toy business using the concept of animatronics. And one of his first ideas was actually to make a monkey in honor of NASA, 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 and their uh, NASA Bahamas, um, remember in their early days of experiments in the early days of the space race, they would use monkeys and stuff. So he thought, I don't know, kids would love that. But Teddy Ruxpin would be a combination of different things uh, 4C had been involved with. It, it had some Disney to it, had a little bit of Atari to it, some Chuck E. Cheese. He, cause he was involved with the startup of the restaurant. So that was some of the influences and Forsey was also responsible for designing the Disney Haunted Mansion. And he also created the heads of the animatronic bears of the Country Bear Jamboree, which you probably remember have seen at some point. So Hasbro originally had some interest in Teddy Ruxpin, but there wasn't really a lot to go off of. At that time, Teddy Ruxpin was basically a bear's head on a stick as a crude prototype. And then ultimately Hasbro wouldn't provide any funding and Jim Henson actually had visited and, and considered it, but ended, ended up passing too. So at this point, like I said, Teddy was just still a head on a stick, but he, it was switched up a bit. They gave him um, movable eyes and a mouth, and he was hooked up to a tape recorder. So it seems kind of terrifying to picture that. So Forsey was able to get the attention of a guy named Don Kingsborough, who was the former head of Atari. So Kingsborough was able, to, he was able to see past this, you know, crude prototype and saw some real possibility. And Forsey had originally started his own company called Alchemy, but Kingsboro started a whole new toy company called Worlds of Wonder in order to produce and sell this new talking bear. So if you had one or you watched the cartoon, I don't know if you remember, there was an actual backstory to Teddy Ruxpin. 
And Forsey had some really good foresight, and he knew that for Teddy Ruxpin to have a future, he needed a good backstory. And this could help lend itself to possible future cartoons or a movie or any other creative endeavors. And Forsey was inspired by his time with Disney, and he realized the importance of story. He took the idea, uh, he took like this idea of story, and he meshed it with a little bit of Lord of the Rings to create a whole different world and it's you know backstory is so important it's why um successful toys like transformers or gi joe or whatever you know they introduce the the toy line with a cartoon series that tells the story like a transforming robot is cool but it's a lot more interesting when you know that this is a species called an autobot that comes from a planet called cybertron and is combating against these evil robots called the Decepticons. There's more connection to the toy there for a kid. And obviously that's what Disney's been doing forever, and it's why they own the entire world. Uh, so he was inspired by all this. So here's the story, the technical story of Teddy Ruxpin. So Teddy comes from the land of Grundo, um, and it comes from an island that is on the southern side called Rilonia. And you would think Teddy Ruxpin would have wouldn't have any like discernible age, but based on the story, he's actually sixteen. One of his best friends that you may remember from the cartoon is an eight legged bug spider thing named Grubby. They make friends with their version of Doc Brown, who's a bumbling inventor named Newton Gimmick. Get it? And as usual, there is an antagonist who is always coming up with evil schemes, and his name was Tweeg. And he was kind of a wannabe wizard. And then Teddy isn't even technically considered a bear based on this backstory. He's an Iliop, which just happens to have a carnivore-like resemblance to bears. And fun fact, if you didn't know this, we got the name Teddy Bear from Teddy Roosevelt, who once refused to shoot a bear. And a stuffed bear was made and dedicated to the president who refused to shoot a bear. And they called it Teddy's Bear. There's the fact of the podcast. So... Here, um, I recommend going on to the show notes today for this episode, which is the whole blog. It's the whole article that's um, to do with this episode. And it's got a lot of different images and some of the original pictures of the prototype um, and how it worked. And so that's everything80spodcast.com slash 10. Everything should be there. If you're listening on YouTube, there'll be a link down below and you can check that out. But there's a lot of, when you look at Teddy Ruxpin on the back, he had a volume button that had low, medium, and high. The controls were pretty simple. It was play and stop the story so you could resume wherever you left off. Uh, you could skip to the beginning of each story or fast forward to your favorite parts. That was the, how the controls were laid out. There was the big slot for inserting the what they called the program cartridge, which looked like an 8-track tape. There was a child safety battery component at the back and then an on-off power switch that would control his functions. The animatronic functions, his eyes and mouth would you know, sync perfectly with the songs or the story. And then there was the advanced easy-to-use program cartridge um, that were e like good for children's hands. They were easy to handle and all that stuff. So they, they, you know, they made note of this. So if you ever held a Teddy Ruxpin or had one in the 80s, you remember it to be pretty bulky and a somewhat heavy toy. And it, it had to, it had to, you know, fit all the, the components into it. But this was, you know, we look on back on technology always and, and kind of laugh. It was actually pretty advanced technology at the time um, as the prototype based on the Disney animatronics required a much larger, uh, basically um, functional, pieces of technology and it needed an entire separate piece to control the face via FM signals. So the fact that they were able to condense this all down into a bear was pretty amazing when, you know, the, the, the if you've seen the Disney animatronics are absolutely massive and it's because they needed to house all those components. But that was the thought, like, how are they going to get this into you know, something manageable and playable so a kid isn't lugging around something the size of a, a small piano. So they were able to, like, you know, change this and get away from the giant sizes and separate pieces when uh, Forsey stumbled upon the idea of using a standard two-track stereo cassette tape, 
where the Disney animatronics, those big giant ones, had to use huge spools of magnetic tape. So this was great because a simple two-track cassette was small enough and it could do the multiple functions you needed. One of the tracks could be used for the recorded audio and the other side could use signals to send commands to a receiver in Teddy's head. If you are under 30, actually maybe even a bit, you probably don't know that a lot of original computing and even home computers use regular cassette tapes to record and store information on and they could send signals and in this case they could do multiple functions as far as controlling the the physical functions of the toy but also have recorded audio and music and stuff like that so if you looked and if you ripped Teddy Ruxman apart in in murderous rage inside him you had three servo motors that were used to control the eyes and the mouth the back of Teddy was where you put the two track cassette. So whatever audio was on that tape would sync up perfectly with the eye and mouth movements. Again, seems kind of primitive, but at the time it was pretty advanced technology, especially to have in a toy. So Teddy would be sold separately from the cassette tapes that, um, or program cartridges is whatever they'd wanted to call them that also came along with a book. So the kids could read along with Teddy, there would be around 60 different tapes that were released and they were available in 13 different languages. So it was very accessible. So you've got this, you know, animatronic bear, but how did they create the voice and the movements? This, all this had to be designed. It, it just didn't happen. They, they needed to have the perfect voice and they wanted to make this toy feel, you know, warm and engaging and not, you know, annoying as hell as so many other talking based toys would always sound like. So 4C was able to use his connections at Disney to get puppeteers to design the movements. Uh, he could get voice actors and he could also get musical directors to kind of create this whole um, world and project. So all the tapes needed a basic soundtrack and 4C got George Wilkins who had created music for Epcot in Florida. And he needed a lot. He ran, around 150 songs would be needed for all the different stories and tapes. So that was a good hookup right there. Phil Barron was the voice of Teddy Ruxpin. So he would have to slightly pitch his voice up to sound a little more cartoony. And then they would record his uh, voice at a slower pace. The audio would be sped up to give Teddy more of a otherworldly sounding voice. It needed to sound familiar, but still... Um, fictional and creative and not, you don't want to say mythical, but that's, that's what they were trying to create with this thing. So they used a puppeteer named Tom Fountain, which is a great name. And he would use a joystick to control Teddy, mo Teddy's movements. He would use a slow pace to design the movements, which would be recorded onto a large magnetic tape spool to then program all the bears to be sold. And this, Fountain guy is interesting because he'd go on to help create the movements of a bit more intense animatronic animatronic creation, which was Chucky in the Child's Play movies. So Teddy Ruxman and Chucky always seem to kind of go hand in hand. But if um, you remember my buddy, that was more of the influence on Chucky. And I have another podcast <laughs> all about that. So Forcey had some other good hookups too, used to record various voices over the stories including uh, the voice of Minnie Mouse, um, I, the guy who did the voice of Goofy, and the guy who would later go on to do the voice of Furby. So, yeah, r crazy good hookup. So here's Teddy Ruxpin hitting the market. So Don Kingsboro didn't leave a lot of time to get Teddy Ruxpin up and running. So the goal, I mean, like with pretty much any toy ever created, was to get it out by Christmas. So this only gave 4C and team about six months to get this thing up and running, which is crazy tight when you think of the years that go into um, product development and creation and testing and all that thing. It, it reminds, it's kind of similar. I recommend going back and listening to my episode on the ET Atari video game. And that what the guy who created that was only given five weeks to create an entire video game. and But that story turned out a lot worse. Please go listen to that episode. It's a good one. So besides just having six months, $60 million was put into the production. And even 
with that large amount of money, it's amazing how Teddy Ruxpin went from a prototype to on a shelf that you could buy in six months. I mean, that just would not happen today. If you think about like the testing and the safety, and then a lot of like kids toys have to be approved by, you know, educational experts and the, the rights and the mark, like, it's just, it's insane that that happens. So Teddy Ruxpin comes out in September, 1985. And before that, there was concern on how they were going to market this rare new toy. It's just, you know, they hadn't really promoted anything like this before. So Forcey signed a deal with ABC to make two live action Teddy Ruxpin specials. These were basically going to be two Saturday morning commercials to sell this bear the same way Transformers cartoon would sell their toys. It would introduce all the characters and the mythology and everything like that. Turns out they wouldn't need the show at all. Worlds of Wonder sold a crazy 41,000 units in the first 30 days. This is pretty much unheard of for a brand new toy and kids went nuts for it. So this was the perfect, perfect storm for toy manufacturers. So the bear basically doesn't work without the tapes. And since this was the hottest toy of the year, parents are pretty much screwed and had to shell out. Um, I don't remember it costing this much. They had to shell out around 59 to $79 for Teddy. When you convert that for inflation in today's prices, that's around 160 bucks for the friggin' bear. I had no idea it cost that much. Probably explained why I never got one for Christmas. Then the cassettes came out at around twelve ninety five a pop, which seems a little more reasonable. Again, this is the mid eighties. You convert that. It's about thirty bucks for a cassette. I mean, kind of in the range, but maybe a bit cheaper than a video game. But you've already it's actually that's a very good way. I never thought of that till right now. That looking at something like Teddy Ruxpin is basically looking like a video game system. Teddy Ruxpin was the Nintendo the cartridges, the tapes were the games and that was the way. And it's obviously why, you know, Nintendo would sell the base units and then you would have to buy the games on top of it. Or if you bought the bigger um, bundles that had controllers and like the zapper guns, it would include like Mario and Duck Hunt. But that was the way to stick it to parents and they really did. So, but whatever, it worked. By the end of the year, Teddy Ruxpin had made a staggering $93 million dollars. And again, that's 1985. So you can multiply that by at least like two to three times. And, you know, not too shabby for a hybrid of Winnie the Pooh, Chuck E. Cheese and and Tolkien. So here's, um, again, looking at a little more where the weirdness, the bizarreness happens. And that's more in the book and the cassette stories. And again, if you had these, you'll remember. If not, this is a refresher. They cover a lot of pretty interesting, uh, you know, themes and stories over those 60 releases. Here's some of the highlights and titles of these different stories. Teddy and the Mud Blubs is being neat hard to do. Grubby's Romance, Falling in Love is Something Special. (laughs) Grunge Music, Tap Your Feet to the Beat. Interesting. This isn't grunge music the way we would know it with Seattle and Flannel, but grunge was um, kind of the characters or whatever, and they made their own. It's like the doozers from Fraggle Rock. Uh, Next one, Autumn Adventure. Teddy and Grubby find out how fun Autumn can be. The Mushroom Forest. You can be anything you want to be. That's interesting. Anything in the soup. Will will These are characters. Will the anythings end up in the grunge gumbo? Teddy Ruxpin sings love songs. A special collection of Teddy's favorites. It's like those Time Life Endless Love um, releases they put out. Teddy Ruxpin visits the dentist. Sponsored by Crest. And of course that would start happening. Like he, it's like he became an Instagram model doing paid promotions. So they go on crazier from here, but it, it feels like a lot of those Sid and Marty Croft um, influences coming back again. If you don't know who Sid and Marty Croft are, look them up and you'll learn all about them. So that leads into the Adventures of Teddy Ruxpin, which was a pretty good cartoon. It ran just from nineteen eighty six to nineteen eighty seven. And they ended up making 65 of them, which is a lot. I didn't see too many of these, but I just, it was good. I remember people really liking this a lot. And, you know, it based, it based the whole thing on that, that creative backstory. And a lot of time was made into making this more about the story than just about selling the bears. They had already been successful and they were able to be a bit more creative with the direction of the show. 
which, you know, like I said, things usually work in reverse is you launch the show to, you start with the show to launch the toys and then the toys follow up and you're basically watching 22 minute commercials that would, you know, if you're watching episodes of GI Joe and Transformers, when the later um, seasons and shows would go on, it's just straight up, you know, there was some creativity and uh, like, I'll give them that. And the people behind Transformers, they, they tried to create a little more mythology, but every episode was to introduce a new character or a to- like a toy or a new vehicle. And it's why, like, if you watch GI Joe, anytime they talk to a person, they, they always reference them by the full name. So you knew which name to look for on the toy when it came out. Same thing with the vehicles. They wouldn't just say like, let's jump in the Jeep. They would, they would say the whole product name, um, vehicle description so again you knew what to look for when you're going into the store so that's what's interesting with this teddy ruxman cartoon they they were already a huge hit because the toy and the commercials worked so well that they were able to make it you know a little more creative kind of if you think of like shows like the muppet babies were able to do that it was more about um the cartoon so the premise of the show is about teddy leaving his homeland of relonia along with grubby trying to find some adventures this is where they meet newton gimmick and they start looking for the treasure of Grundo and they accidentally find six crystals with different meanings and powers. So I don't know if they ripped this from the five rings from Lord of the Rings or is this kind of like, feels like uh, the Infinity Stones from Marvel. I don't know. Somehow these are all connected. Anyway, the six crystals can enable the Monsters and Villains organization, Mavo or Mavo, that can have complete rule over the land. There's a leader of Mavo called Quellor, who's probably like Thanos, and he wants to make sure that an Iliop is never able to possess the crystals. Teddy is an Iliop, in case you've forgotten, and not a bear, because that would just be crazy. So they also encounter Tweeg, who's also trying to create and cause problems, and he's sort of a troll who wants to join Mavo or Mavo. And he's also considered a grunge, again, not connected to the Seattle music scene. So all in all, the adventures of Teddy Ruxpin were really about creativity, adventure, um, and, and wandering through different lands. So now this leads to the downfall of Worlds of Wonder. I mean, everything's going on along swimmingly. The Toys on Monster hit for multiple Christmases. That does not happen a lot. And the cartoon is connecting with kids. So what could go wrong? Quite a bit, actually. Glad you asked. There were a few issues that faced Worlds of Wonder. They were apparently not that quick on shipping out inventory, so shelves in stores went empty more than they were full. And I vaguely remember this too, that you didn't walk in to a Toys R Us and just see tons of Teddy Ruxins on the shelves like you know Buzz Lightyear and Toy Story. Um, there's also the now the onslaught of other talking-based toys that are you know completely trying to copy, fair enough, starting to flood the market, and they're cheaper. So there's also this issue. Worlds of Wonder wasn't just making Teddy Ruxpin. Um, that would have been a waste. You know, they needed a more extensive toy line. So due to the like, due to that higher end technology that made up te- Teddy Ruxpin, they carried that over into making other higher tech toys. That was their thing. One of these toys was the now familiar laser tag. But again, uh, who, who knows if you remember this or not? This is a pretty tragic situation that hit in 1987 when there was a 19 year old kid who was shot and killed near LA and he was carrying one of those laser tag guns, you know, just a cheap, they're like 40 bucks. And, you know, it obviously looks like a weapon, but not full on. And the police mistook that for a real one. This is obviously some terrible press and a terrible situation and it starts hurting their profits. Plus add to that, all the new talking toys that flooded the market makes Teddy Lux or Teddy Ruxman less unique. And I don't I don't think I mentioned that World of Wonders was the original distributor for the first Nintendo. Well, they were, and after all the bad press, Nintendo wants nothing to do with them. So that's just like the final nail in the coffin there. So with just four days before Christmas, 1987, World of Wonders files for bankruptcy. They tried to t- discount Teddy Ruxman down to 30 bucks. But it was too late. Teddy Ruxpin was dead. <laughs> R.I.P. But was there a new Teddy Ruxpin? Like, you know, like with most brands and franchises, if you give it enough time, the interest is going to come back around. And it actually didn't take that long at first. Worlds of Wonder was officially done in 1991, and Teddy Ruxpin was picked up by Hasbro. 
He was redesigned and released, re-released under the Play School line um, to be a little more youthful, a little more kid-friendly. Not that it wasn't before, but like a little bit younger. That lasted until 1996, and Teddy was updated from cassettes to more of a different cartridge format. So then in 1998, Yes Entertainment, with an exclamation mark after the Yes, brought Teddy back for the third time. They returned him to his original size, and they went back to using the cassette tapes. They even introduced TV Teddy, which was a pretty elaborate system that connected with VHS tapes and an RF transmitter to try and make Teddy more interactive. And I'd never heard of this one until I was researching everything. But again, check the, go to the show notes or at least look up the commercials for this TV Teddy. Um, it will scare the living hell out of you. Uh, so, uh, spoiler alert, this version didn't last. And Teddy was then introduced for a fourth time by Backpack Toys. Now things go digital and they replace the cassettes with actual digital cartridges and you can actually still find these and and purchase them. So that brings us up to today. Wicked Cool Toys, which I imagine imagine is out of Boston for some reason, brought back Teddy in the fall of 2017. So he looks a bit different this time. He's smaller. He's got blue eyes now and those eyes are actually screens which can change through various graphics. So this time there's no physical cartridge, but he comes pre-programmed with three different stories and all the other stories can be purchased through a mobile app. Makes sense. Trying to keep up with everything. So I'm not sure if that's going to be the last iteration of Teddy Ruxpin, but only time will tell. So I'll start wrapping it up here. Some final thoughts. Again, I, I'm pretty sure you have no idea that the depth that went behind this toy and the character. I, I definitely had no idea about everything that went behind this till I started researching it. It was kind of just like a throwaway thing, like, oh, this will be interesting to write about and record. And the deeper you go, you're like, wow, there's a lot to this. Um, something that I thought was just so simple and straightforward, like bringing out a talking bear. Boom, nope, a lot more to it. And I think Teddy Ruxpin will always be meaningful and find a place in pop culture through, you know, whether it's podcasts like this or the blog I put out or whatever, um, that you know, or even has a slight connection, say with like Ted in the, in the Ted movies. But if you have one kicking around in the attic, you might want to dust it off and take a trip down memory lane to see one of the most popular toys of the eighties, a massive success. And then a very, very fast downfall, but then continuing, continuing reiterations that have come out over the years. And hopefully that one does come to life and try to kill you in your sleep. Okay. So let's wrap it up on that good note. Thanks again for listening. Appreciate you taking the time. Again, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast. If you're listening on YouTube, you can subscribe there and like it and comment if you want. I'm good either way. If you really like the show, uh, listening to the podcast and on Apple Podcasts, leave it a rating review. That way more people get to see it. Check out the show notes again for this episode. So that's everything at podcast.com slash 10. That's it for me. See you later.